do auditing, commercial audit, benefit plan, tax exempt entities. Tax exempt entities is really one of our specialties. Uh, as long as we have a public entity group, which probably a lot of you are familiar with, that does school boards, municipalities, counties. And of course, I'm in the tax department. Uh, you know, we do partnerships, LLCs, S corporations, C corporations, individual returns, estates and trusts. And also, you know, one of the services we started up in the last couple of years is client accounting services, uh, where we do the bookkeeping for clients and, you know, virtually uh, a virtual uh, CFO service. Uh, so if you don't have the resources to hire a CFO, we do kind of the CFO services for clients. And basically, pay, almost pay the client's bills for them, uh, client accounting services does. They set it up, client clicks a button, and they pay their bills. Uh, we also do uh, fiduciary accountings, attorney trust accounts, and then we also have Nizavacha Wealth Management, which um, has about 900 million. I asked this question yesterday because the number always varies. They told me they have about 900 million assets in the management, which includes the individual accounts, IRAs, 401ks, SEP IRAs, business uh, 401ks that they set up for businesses and. You know, a lot of cash balance plans that we do for our clients for tax uh, planning reasons. And they also do life insurance and long-term care. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to the actual presentation. Now, look, I wanted to start with death of the estate tax. A few years ago, it seemed like the estate tax was just basically disappearing. And that the estate tax was on its way out. You know, more and more states uh, as we'll talk about later in New Jersey, more and more states were eliminating the estate tax. More and more state, uh, the federal government was raising the estate tax exemption. And it seemed like the estate tax uh, was going out the door. And then it became more, more important what the client wanted to do and accomplish with their funds. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, we'll meet with a client. I'm sure any of you guys who are in estate planning, uh, are kind of in the same situation. You come up with a great estate plan that's gonna save the client money. And the client's really not always worried about saving estate tax dollars. They wanna you know, control their assets after they pass away when they're little, you know, as Marsha Gelman, my uh, former boss used to say to me, when they're no longer sitting at the table. And that the, you know, they wanna you know, have their money go to their children or they might wanna be in trust because you know, their child is not great with money um, so they want to control their assets and how they're going to be uh, distributed and how they're going to be used, um, continue their business after they pass away. And not necessarily is always minimizing taxes the top priority, whether it's income taxes or estate taxes or inheritance taxes. And that was, you know, a very common theme, especially when the estate tax exemption has been going up. And the tax liability for most people was either non-existent or uh, relatively small. And this kind of gives you a quick chart, credit to Tax Foundation uh, for this chart. And it just kind of shows you that the states in gray um, are all the states with no estate tax. The states in kind of like a purple color, New Jersey's one of them, uh, are the states with inheritance tax. The states in red are the states with a, uh, an estate tax. So you're looking at a large, you know, percentage of the country where the states have no estate tax, no inheritance tax. So this is what I was talking about, kind of the death of the estate tax. More and more states, as the federal exemption went up, most states kind of had a, a pickup tax of the state death tax credit. And as the state tax went up, uh, the federal exemption went up, um, states eliminated the estate tax. And it's also competing for the elderly uh, to move there. You know, Florida, didn't have the estate tax and it was an attractive place for people to move and more and more states wanted to keep people in place and eliminate the estate tax. And only one state has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax and that's Maryland. New Jersey was one until uh, recently but Maryland is now the only state that has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax. In 2001, as we'll kind of look at some uh, charts in a few seconds, 2001, the state tax exemption was $675,000. $675,000. Let me 
Again, the state tax was uh, $675,000. The number of tax returns filed was 109,600 returns filed. So the number of 706s, Form 706, federal state tax re returns filed in 2001 when the exemption was 675,000 was 109,000. As we're all kind of going through this pandemic and we're seeing uh, our house values rise, you know, a lot of people in New Jersey, their house alone is worth 675. So, and that was the New Jersey state tax exemption for many, many years was 675. Now, as we know, the federal exemption in 2021, 2020 was, is over $11 million. So the number of deaths in America were 2.8 million people died in uh, 2020. The number of state tax returns filed was 4,100. The number of uh, re returns reporting a liability was only 1,900. So 1,900 people uh, paid a state tax of 2.8 million people who died in 2020. A very, very small percentage. It kind of, you know, I always wondered why the estate tax was disappearing. And I think there was an element of fairness. You know, where, as you accumulate, the guy who was saving their assets, um, or person was saving their assets, was getting income subject to income taxes as they went along. So they're paying, if you're doing well, you're paying 37% income tax. You're paying 39.6% uh, income tax back in the day. So you're accumulating your wealth as, um, and paying income tax on it. And then when you passed away, you're subject to another tax, the estate tax. And that was viewed kind of as unfair at the time. And that people were being double taxed because they already uh, paid tax on the accumulation of, of that wealth. As we kind of look here, this is kind of what we're talking about is this, you look at this chart and you see 2001, 675, and now 2020, we're up over $11 million. And as we kind of look at it, the number of state tax returns obviously goes down. Uh, state tax returns filed, the state tax returns uh, subject to tax are going down as uh, the state tax exemption goes up. And I always like to say 2010, if you, you know, we're practicing at this time. Um, I always consider it the George Steinbrenner year. Now, George Steinbrenner, he was born on the 4th of July, owner of the Yankees, if you didn't know, uh, for many years. I think he bought the Yankees in 1973 from CBS for, you know, $6 million, $10 million, relatively small amount. When he passed away, his net worth was $1.1 billion, which included the S Network and the Yankees. And he did not pay any estate tax because he passed away in the year the estate uh, tax uh, disappeared. So probably saved his estate uh, probably about four or five hundred million dollars at least, uh, not being subject to estate taxes. And I think also enabled the family to keep the, uh, the Yankees. Uh, the family still owns the Yankees, and they didn't have to sell it to finance the estate tax. Uh, but yeah, I always consider it the George Steinbrenner year because he, you know, uh, you're never lucky when you pass away, but uh, he died, unfortunately, in the right year when there was no estate tax. As we kind of look at this chart as well, um, we're looking at 2001, 675, $23.7 billion raised in the estate tax. And then as we go along, See 2017, that was when the exemption was about $5 million. There was about 5,500 returns filed that were subject to estate tax. And then 2018, the exemption jumped up to about $11 million. The number of returns uh, filed for uh, subject to estate tax dropped. Okay. So now we're in 2021 and the climate has definitely changed. And there's definitely a re-looking at um, a state tax. And, uh, you know, I want, we're kind of getting to the update before we kind of look at more of the basic uh, things because I think this is so important that people be aware of what's brewing. Now we're all, this is basically speculation based on uh, proposals made, but um, I would think that we're all going to see a huge change in the estate tax uh, and gift tax and trusts. And that law seems to be evolving um, in towards more of a tax liability for the wealthy. And 
I think most people who've gone through COVID, you know, we've all seen the amount of money the government is spending uh, to keep the economy going during the initial COVID. Now we're doing infrastructure spending. Um, I think universally agreed that taxes are probably only going one way, at least in the short term up. And I think that would include estate taxes as well. It seems like the, we have to pay for the spending to some extent. And it seems like uh, taxes, um, income taxes, estate taxes are headed trending upwards. And also, as we kind of look at this, um, the rationale for this is this kind of dy uh, dynasty wealth, generational wealth, the richest 1% own 32% of the nation's wealth, and the bottom 50% own 2% 2 of the nation's wealth. And some of these proposals, the proposals overall could raise $430 billion over 10 years. So um, it's a significant amount of money being taken in by the government. And also it's gonna kind of move um, redistribution of the wealth, which is kind of, I think has a lot of public support as you know, you see, um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos with over a hundred billion dollars. I think he lost $13 billion in uh, one day because the uh, Amazon stock moved in one direction or one week lost over $13 billion. So there's people with enormous wealth and there's definitely seems to be trending support to tax that kind of uh, generational wealth. So always the question is what is gonna be subject to tax and at what level is gonna be subject to tax? I think there, there's basically three different proposals at this point. There's the 99.5% Act, uh, the Sensible Taxation and Equity Promotion Act or like as referred to as the STEP Act. And then there's the Green Book, which is basically President Biden's um, kind of revenue proposals for 2022. And I like to think of the state tax and these bills as, I think Bernie Sanders' um, estimated wealth is about $2, uh, $2 million, $2.5 million, is kind of what his estimated wealth was in Forbes. And it seems like Bernie, um, he went to see an estate planning attorney and he got a little advice on the estate planning and he came out of that meeting with a lot of ideas to kind of um, eliminate some of the methods that estate tax planning attorneys use um, to pass wealth on tax rate. And he, you know, the people who have worked on this really had an idea of what they wanted to accomplish um, in terms of ending some of the practices that attorneys use. Now, always the question is, it's a proposal. Can it become law? No one knows. Um, the Democrats are pretty much the ones who support it. I think there's gonna be very little Republican support for it. Now, disregarding the politics of it, uh, the Democrats have a six seat advantage, I believe, in the House, roughly, and the Senate's 50-50. Now, Democrats control the Senate because they have a Bryce, uh, the Vice President breaks the tie, uh, Vice President Harris would break the tie. And as you kind of hear a lot of things in the news, if you watch uh, the news, is about the 60 vote filibuster rule. Um, you know, whether they're gonna eliminate that rule or you know, it seems like uh, it's gonna be very difficult to eliminate that rule because you still have some support. Um, but that 60 vote filibuster rule in the Senate doesn't apply um, to uh, this type of tax bill. So Trump was able to get his, and I thought, I never thought Trump was able, being able to get his uh, uh, tax bill through the uh, Senate, but he was able to get it through the Senate um, and this would kind of pass along the same ways as the Trump tax bill got through. And I think we're gonna see some type of uh, tax bill from the Democrats within the next year. It's just a question of what's gonna be in it and how much of it's gonna be estate planning. You know, state, estate taxes are very um, attractive to increase because it's a tax on the very wealthy and it's impacting, as we kind of said, the act is, uh, Bernie's act is the 99.5% act. So therefore he's thinking that it only impacts 0.5% of Americans. So, you know, 0.5%, the 99.5% are gonna be okay with it. The 0.5% are really the ones who will be impacted and you know, that's a very small percentage of Americans and it seems like it has a lot of support. 
Okay, we're going to kind of get into the meat of it a little bit here. Hey, Glenn, should we uh, do a sure. polling question real quick, if you don't mind? Sure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead Thank and watch it first, Paul, of course. Everyone should see a polling question come up. Just make sure you answer it for um, credit. And which state, the question is, which state has both an estate tax and an inheritance tax? New Jersey, Maryland, New York, or California? We'll give everybody another minute to vote. Just keep in mind, you know, make sure you do the uh, polling questions because that's how uh, we verify the accounts that we're required to do so. And pretty much everybody got it right. New Jersey was one of them. We eliminated, uh, we only have one tax now, uh, the inheritance tax. And Maryland is the only one, 87%. Got that right. Okay. So now we'll move on to kind of the current rules and where things are going a little in a lot more detail. Now, as most people know, the state tax exemption right now is over $11 million. So between the married couple, you can transfer $23,400,000 of wealth, not subject to a state tax. Uh, the rate right now is 40%. Now, regardless of what uh, President Biden uh, and uh, proposes, so if nothing even goes through uh, through the House, Senate, and signed by the President, the estate tax exemption, the Trump increase, is set to end in 2026. Therefore, the estate tax is going down regardless. So it's going to go down, uh, it's going to be trending down in 2026, even if nothing is passed, which seems unlikely. It, it seems like something's going to go through, but we don't know what. But even if nothing goes through, keep in mind 2026 is going down to five, uh, five million dollars adjusted for inflation. Should probably be in the 5.8, 6 million dollar range at that time, maybe a little more. Um, you know, the proposed change, and this was Bernie's uh, proposal, and it seems like uh, President Biden is kind of on board with similar uh, type uh, schedule. Is that 3.5 million? Unadjusted for inflation, it seems like what Bernie's proposal was. So therefore, kind of like 3.5 kind of um, melts away over time as uh, inflation keeps uh, increasing the value of our houses and our property. Um, so 3.5 million. So you'd be going down from 11.7 million uh, to 3.5 million and 7 million for a couple compared to 23.4 million, which is a major, major change. And the rates are, would be going up. So it would be 45% once you hit 3.5 million, 50% over 10 million, 55% uh, over 50 million, and 65% over a billion dollars. Now we should all have that problem when we have a billion dollars or over 50 million dollars, uh, but we're talking a very significant tax. And it would also be minus prior gifts. So if you give it away, it seems like the way the law is written, and if you've already given away $10 million uh, using up your current uh, estate tax exemption, estate and gift tax exemption of $11.7 million, uh, you'd have no exemption left. So you would have a taxable state. And a couple of the other ideas, we're going to go into these a lot more, uh, a lot more details we kind of go along here. Um, but these were some of the ideas that are kind of being put forth. And uh, I think a lot of them have a lot of traction. Um, you're looking at lifetime gifting, instead of being the whole 3.5 million, it would be limited to 1 million. So your lifetime gifting exemption would be only $1 million. Wouldn't even be the full 3.5 million. Uh, the annual exclusion, we'll kind of talk about that. They're talking about limiting the annual exclusion. Discounts, as, you know, we all kind of dealt with before Trump became president, President Trump. Um, they were talking about, you know, changing the rules on discounts and valuations. Um, you know, the new rules uh, that proposed by the president and uh, Bernie, kind of go back to that. Uh, there's a little bit of attack on grants or trust, grants, uh, generating skipping tax, capital gains tax, dynasty trusts are, you know, definitely going to be under attack. Seems like portability is going to survive. So portability seems like it survives. 
and therefore it's simply if your spouse passed away uh, and you filed an estate tax return for $11.7 million exemption in 2021, it seems like that's going to go on. 2021, is this, is this our last chance to take advantage of that $11.7 million? You know, uh, as many people kind of in the practice uh, dealt with 2012, I believe was the year where the estate exemption was going to kind of be phased out. And, you know, there was major, um, you know, it seemed like it was going to go back to a lower level. It was, I think, about $5 million at the time. And there was major gifting going on uh, during that year, and especially at the end of the year. And the question is, is 2021 a similar year where we're going to see a massive number of gifting? And as you kind of uh, do practice, you know, assets that need valuation need um, more time to um, be valued, and they can't be just gifted at once. There's a lot of issues sometimes with valuing them. Uh, Katie, if you could just launch another polling question, please. Okay. What is the current federal estate tax exemption about? 5.85 million, 10.5 million, 23.4 million, or 11.7 million? The current federal estate tax exemption in 2021. We'll give everybody another missed answer. Okay. Pretty much everybody got it right. $11.7 million is the current federal estate tax exemption. And this kind of shows you this is what this chart here kind of goes back to 3.5 million and it just shows what the impact that is. You know, a person who's got $11.7 million state right now is not subject to any, any state tax. And that person would be paying uh, about $5 million, $5.1 million in state tax. So that's a massive change going from no estate tax to $5.1 million, um, you know, roughly half their estate would be subject to a state tax. So that, that's a good chunk of change. Um, we should all have this problem of having $2 billion. Um, they would go from $795 million in state tax to $1.1 million to $1.2 million in state tax and increase to about $400 million. Um, I'd like to have that problem. I'm sure you would as well, but even $400 million, um, you know, is another large amount of money. Now this is one of the proposals, and I think this is one of the most interesting proposals, and it already kind of has, and I think um, Canada has a method similar to this. And I think this is, it's an interesting proposal, and I, I, I could kind of see this going through. So it's kind of, uh, we'll see what happens with it, but I think it has a lot of traction, and it's already worked in Canada, so I think uh, politicians know that, and are the people advising the politicians know that, and therefore they kind of like the idea. Uh, under current law, as most of you kind of probably are aware, we get you get a step up in basis. So you get a step up basis to the fair market value at the time uh, the decedent passes away. So to, just to give you an example, the decedent paid two hundred thousand dollars for a portfolio, and the fair market value at the time he passes away is five uh, five million dollars. Uh, the beneficiary takes a $5 million tax basis. So the appreciation of $4.8 million is never subject to income taxes. Uh, the beneficiary would only pay taxes on the growth beyond $5 million. So, and that, the biggest thing about that, that applies even if there isn't a federal estate tax. So we said the exemption right now is $11.7 million or $23.4 million for a couple. And um, therefore, you're talking 11.7, but theoretically, $11.7 million or $23.4 million could pass from generation, uh, one generation to the next, never paying any income tax. So if you bought something for one, $1 and it ended up being worth $23.4 million for a couple, $23.4 million goes to uh, their children not subject to any uh, a state tax and not subject to any income tax. So all the $23 million in capital gains tax 
that would have been payable if they sold the stock during their lifetime is not disappears, that tax disappears, that taxable income disappears um, as a result of the step up in basis, even though there's no estate tax paid. So, and this could also, as uh, just to let you know, generation skipping tax also, that's the same amount for your generation skipping tax exemption. So therefore it could pass to the grandchildren and not subject to any estate tax or generation skipping tax. So you're talking about real sizable wealth passing to generation to generation where no, um, no income taxes are paid because of the step up in basis. And also, uh, you know, the way things stand today is that um, when the next generation passes, they have their estate tax exemption. So the future increase in value, um, you know, the index for inflation could be uh, estate tax exemption 50 years from now could be significantly higher. And when the a grandchild passes away, and even ten, uh, the increase in value would miss uh, the appreciated value would skip taxes again, income taxes again. So you're talking about generational wealth where someone's collecting the dividends, paying tax on the dividends, but the increase in value of the underlying stock could escape taxation for generations, if not sold. Under the Canada method, I like to call it the Canada method because they were the first person, uh, state that I know or country that started it, was they treated the death of the person as a taxable event. Now, uh, there's other, you know, other ideas where the beneficiary kind of takes the ta uh, deceased tax basis. I think that's an unworkable idea for the most part because, um, you know, if no estate tax return is filed, you're talking about, um, you know, trying to figure out what a person's tax basis is from 50 years ago. Uh, if any of you do your own tax returns you know, in, on stock trades, which there isn't a tax basis being tra tracked, um, you know, it's a lot of work to figure out what people's tax basis is or what your tax basis is. And uh, when you go back years and years, you know, information kind of disappears. So the easier method for the most part would be creating um, death via taxable event, no step up in basis, and at the death of a person at $5 million, uh, $4.8 million in gain would be subject to tax. And that President Biden's proposal kind of goes a long ways to doing that. And his proposal, and I think Bernie also had a similar proposal and uh, the Step Act, uh, uh, Step Act also was kind of in the same ballpark was uh, the first $1 million of unrealized capital gains would be exempt. So that $1 million when you pass away would not, uh, would not be subject to tax. So the appreciated value of $1 million when a person passes away is not subject to tax. $2 million for a married couple would escape taxation. And also they're talking about your principal residence exclusion would kind of still apply. So even though you passed away, your principal residence exclusion wouldn't disappear. And the issue kind of the one million unrealized capital gains could be in the partnership, could be in uh, closely held C corporation. So you're looking at assets that could be, you know, have a capital gains event, but could be uh, very illiquid real estate. And they're talking about allowing taxpayers to kind of pay in installments over 15 years. Now, Right now, when assets pass to your U.S. spouse, they're not, they kind of um, get the step up in basis, but your spouse doesn't pay tax on it. And we'll talk about that kind of marital deduction that we'll talk about a little bit later. But the U.S. spouse, under these rules, the capital gains tax of death, the U.S. spouse or a charity, someone who's not paying tax, estate taxes, would just kind of receive the carryover basis of the decedent. And then they're talking about a little exemption for certain family-owned business and operated. Um, you know, as this is a proposal, it's really not clear how that would play out and what's going to be the specific criteria that people would have to meet. Um, but that's also out there. But you're looking at a significant ta taxable event. Even this is not even the state taxes that we're talking the $3.5 million uh, uh, exemption amount. This is $1 million, your limit to $1 million of unrealized capital gains. So one of the President Biden's proposals is to increase the capital gains rate. 
And uh, how this would apply to someone who passed away is kind of unclear, but the president's proposal is to increase the capital gains rate. Right now, top capital gains rate is 20%. There's also something called the net investment tax, but let's just keep it kind of a little sim bit simple. The top capital gains rate is 20%. Um, President Biden's proposal, if you made more than $1 million, will be the top capital gains bracket would go up to the ordinary income rate, and his proposed ordinary income rate is 39.6%. So you would go from theoretically paying no taxes uh, because of a step up in basis to paying possibly as much as 39.6%. So that, that's a major shift. Um, these are proposals, so we don't know where it's going to come out. But there definitely seems to be a an appetite for you know kind of taxing that unrealized appreciation, and you will see this in a lot of proposals that we're going to kind of go through, is that the unrealized uh, appreciation um, of the seedings, the states and trusts is really where it's one of the large factors that they're looking at. Kind of just to give you a real quick example, uh, someone passes away with a five million dollar estate. Under the current rules, they're under the estate tax threshold. They're paying no estate taxes. They're getting a step up in basis uh, for most of the assets to the date of death value. So no taxes are being paid. Now, even without factoring in the $3.5 million change, uh, exemption change down to the $3.5 million exemption, uh, if the person had $4 million in unrealized uh, uh, if the person had, uh, let's say, $5 million in unrealized appreciation, $1 million goes tax-free, $4 million is taxable at death, and you're looking at, um, even without a change in the capital gains rates, of a tax of, of $800,000. So the person would have gone from paying no taxes to paying $800,000 in taxes without even considering the change in capital gains rates. Uh, excuse me, change in the state tax uh, exemption amount. Now, the good news or bad news is a lot of uh, people's assets right now are held in IRAs, 401ks, and that's something we'll kind of talk about a little bit later, but that's considered income with respect to the decedent, which are basically the decedent never paid tax on it. So a traditional IRA, a traditional 401k, uh, if the decedent dies with those assets, uh, when the beneficiary withdraws them for the estate, the estate is going to pay income tax on it. So therefore, they're not really they're not impacted by this one million dollar capital gain because they didn't really receive a step up in basis anyway. So therefore, when uh, the money comes out, it's going to be subject to ordinary income tax, uh, same as before. Proposed valuation rules. Now this kind of gets into. It was uh, proposed regulations before President Trump became president, 2016-2017, uh, and then uh, the regulations were scrapped. Now, what's coming back is kind of a little bit similar but different. Um, basically, the, uh, the lack of control, minority, they, the idea is discounts when you state or get those assets to a person, you take a discount. Um, the fair mark, the total value of the company is $5 million, and you're gifting $1 million of the uh, stock, you take a discount, so the value that you're gifting is even less than a $1 million. That's based on minority owner uh, has less control. You don't control when dividends are declared, or uh, you don't set all the policies, so therefore it's always been viewed as um, okay to take the discount or a reasonable discount. Same from uh, marketability. You can sell shares of Apple on the stock and you know realize your money in the next day. It's not so easy to sell shares of your partnership interests or your corporate uh, small privately held corporations. So there's a marketability discount. Um, and usually, um, the IRS has not had too much problem with that unless you're uh, overly aggressive. Now the proposed changes kind of eliminate those discounts for a large extent. If your family, say a dad is transferring part of uh, his company, 20% to each person, he was taking a discount before of uh, marketability and uh, control. Now, if your family's in control of the entity or the transferees in control of the entity, no discount. Also, um, no discount for marketable securities and cash, 
in passive assets, it seems like the only uh, time that discounts are going to be allowed is it's an active business, assets used in an active business, and your family's not in control after the, the transfer. So just kind of keep a heads up on that. That's where it seems like it's trending. And this one is, I thought, a very interesting one, and I actually kind of understand it, uh, why they're thinking this. The annual gift tax exclusion right now is $15,000. So you can give money, $15,000, to um, your son, the grandchild, and you know, cash, and uh, you don't even have to file a gift tax return. And if you're married, you can give $30,000 uh, to without uh, using up any of your state gift tax exemption. Now, we use this, you know, attorneys uh, who are practicing in this area uh, use this to transfer funds to trust. And specifically, I think it's used a lot for insurance trust um, and uh, crummy powers. Now, the annual gift tax exclusion is only available if you're gifting a present interest. So when you give money to a trust, it doesn't necessarily meet that annual exclusion. So you give crummy powers to the trust where the, uh, a list of people, family members, uh, generally can take funds from the trust. They have an uh, ability to withdraw the funds from the trust. I'm sure uh, they would be cut out of the will if they did, but they have the option of withdrawing funds from the trust. Uh, and those are called crummy powers. And that makes it meet the annual exclusion. Now, you, I've seen uh, documents written where you could have 40 people with uh, crummy powers. So you're talking 40 times 15, and that adds up. And the IRS, Bernie, when he went to the uh, his estate planning attorney, kind of learned about crummy powers, um, and he said, you know, that doesn't seem quite fair. Uh, you know, you're transferring money to a trust, you're take, creating these crummy powers, and therefore um, you're allowing huge amounts of money being passed into a trust without ever uh, being subject to even gift tax or using a person's exemption. So what they're talking about is capping that at two times the annual exclusion. So you'd only be able to transfer $30,000 to the trust. And you know, some clients with large uh, life insurance policies, um, their premiums might be well over $30,000. It might be $100,000, it might be $200,000. and uh, use crummy powers to avoid uh, the gift tax on that, the, the uh, client from passing those funds over to pay those premiums. And it seems like that's one of the areas that they're looking to attack is limiting those uh, transfers using the annual exclusion, the crummy power transfers, to only two times the annual exclusion, so roughly $30,000. It seems like you know right now you can transfer funds to a 529 plan and upfront it. <coughs> excuse me, uh, five times uh, the annual exclusion amount, and that seems like it's not going to change. But definitely, life insurance is where they're looking at. So you know, one of the ideas would be to fund the life insurance with something that um, creates enough income to pay the premiums in the future. Uh, but that might not be so easy. If you have significant premiums, you would be looking at a huge amount of income that that uh, trust would need to generate. Graphs. This is an area that um, has long been disfavored by uh, uh, progressives and moderate politicians, and people have really been looking at this for years. And it's basically, with low interest rates, graphs have basically used to shift the upside appreciation, to shift the uh, the increase in value of a stock, uh, a partnership interest, to the uh, beneficiaries of the graph. So the grantor retains his interest for a period of time, and these, the appreciation at a very low rate, um, so the appreciation above that rate goes to the beneficiaries without being subject to a state gift tax. A, a gift tax. So one of the proposals is kind of to limit that ability to do that. So the grant uh, remains your interest must be at least 25% of the fair market value uh, or 500,000 the greater of those two. So basically they're looking to really um, limit the ability of grants to transfer the appreciated value on assets. So you should no longer look, transfer uh, a stock that you know that's going to go up and appreciate over time um, looking to kind of limit your ability to 
kind of freeze the value in your estate and gift by moving the appreciation to the beneficiary. And we're really looking to eliminate that. And here we go, grantor trust. Uh, you know, uh, if you're an attorney practicing in the area, you're probably aware of a lot of these rules already, but one of the areas are really looking to crack down is on grantor trust. The grantor trusts are uh, used for all sorts of reasons. The basic idea of a grantor trust is that, you know, the grantor puts money in, into the trust. A lot of times he's paying gift tax on that initial or, or reporting the gift uh, of the initial transfer into the trust. And he's kind of freezing the value of, this, uh, of the assets to the amount that he transferred over to the trust. So the appreciation, same idea, the appreciation is kind of outside the grantor's taxable estate. And the great thing about grantor trust is the grantor uh, pays the income tax. So the trust generates $100,000 of income. The grantor is paying the income tax on that $100,000, and that paying the tax on that $100,000 income doesn't count as another taxable gift. Um, and also, the grantor kind of kind of do transactions between that grantor trust and himself, and they kind of they're not taxable. And he can substitute assets, move money around, borrow funds. And, you know, grantor trusts um, have long, even though it's based on IRS code, um, Internal Revenue Code, uh, 671 through 679, they've long been viewed as uh, kind of creating, um, playing estate tax games for uh, certain people and moving income and avoiding estate tax on the increase in value of a large number of assets. And that's as, we, as I said at the beginning, was that's what they're looking to crack down on is uh, avoiding tax on depreciation, depreciated value. And what these the proposed rules on grantor trust are going to be, essentially the grantor is going to pay, uh, if it's a grantor trust, they're going to try to pull the grantor trust into the taxable estate of the grantor. So right now, you can do uh, intentionally defective grantor trust, which is going to be taxable for income taxes purposes for the grantor, uh, even though the um, beneficiaries of the trust might be someone else, and, the, and it would not be included in your estate. So now they're changing that so the grantor uh, trust would now be included in the taxable state of the grantor, which is a huge change. Um, also, they're looking at distributions of the purse of the trust going to a, the non-owner, the non-deed owner, the, non, the grantor, as a taxable gift. So assets going out of the trust right now, the grantor is paying tax on the trust. The assets, the distribution should be going to somebody else. And they're looking to change that to make those uh, distributions from a grantor trust as additional taxable gifts. Now, who will this impact? There is a, Gratz did not have a uh, kind of grandfathered safe harbor. Uh, grantor trusts do, but the problem is, um, you know, future gifts to that trust and sales of assets will kind of uh, impact uh, the amount that's grandfathered. It's also, you're not grandfathered for the new GST rules. So, this would be a major, major change because a lot of clients only have grantor trust that they created and they were designed for uh, estate tax reasons. And, um, you know, there, this would be a major change. It would be a major change to the profession because grantor trusts are being used all the time, probably much more even than graft. Jen? Hey, Glenn, you want to do another yes, poll? Yes, let's really do quick. Uh, another poll. Let's do two quick, straight polling questions just to kind of catch up. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna do the first one now. As the estate tax exemption goes up, the number of federal form 706 filed goes up, down, or stays about the same. So if the estate tax exemption went from 675,000 in 2001 to 11.7 million, uh, has the number of <coughs> uh, state tax returns, uh, federal 706 has gone up or down, or stayed about the same. We'll give everybody another minute to answer. Okay. 
So down 88%, that's the right answer. So it's gone down dramatically. Okay. Okay, just once another po polling question so we can kind of catch up. The current annual gift tax exclusion is 14,000, 15,000, 28,000, or 30,000. So the amount of the current 2021 annual exclusion. Another minute for everybody to kind of catch up. Almost everybody got $15,000. This is probably the one that impacts, I think, people the most. It's the annual exclusion now. And I can't see them ever getting rid of that completely because, you know, we're all making gifts to family, friends, and, uh, you know, I think that's going to be around to stay. Um, generation skipping trust. This is the exact area that, um, that Bernie's looking and, you know, President Biden are looking at as kind of that uh, dynasty wealth kind of passing from generation to generation, but um, escaping taxation. So the current exemption, as everybody kind of knows, and we talked about before, is $11.7 million. That's your state and gift tax exemption uh, combined, and it's also your generation skipping tax exemption. Um, what they're looking to do is kind of create rules where qualifying trusts must terminate uh, within 50 years to qualify for generation, uh, use your generation skipping tax exemption. So you're looking at 50 years, and pre existing trusts must terminate within 50 years of the enactment. So you're looking at kind of those generation skipping tax trusts ending on a 50 year basis, which would be a major change. So kind of um, if you're an heir to the, you know, Walmart and the money was put in trust and it's kind of going on and on and on, um, you know, this would crack down on those type of trusts, those generation skipping tax trusts. And it would be, as it, it kind of, um, you know, generation skipping tax is kind of one of the nastiest taxes because you could be paying estate taxes, which could be 40, 50%. And then you could, if it's going to, beyond your generation skipping tax uh, exemption, uh, you'd be paying another 40, 50% on that. So most trusts are designed to either use to be a zero inclusion ratio or one, and um, you use your state tax exemption and get a GST exemption and make that a zero and uh, inclusion ratio for generation skipping taxes or uh, create a trust in a way that it's not going to be subject to generation skipping taxes. So this would kind of change the rules on that by um, cracking down on 50 year and years uh, term uh, limit. Now, who knows if, you know, what the rules would be in 50 years if it worked that way. This is the, another area where it kind of gets very interesting. Uh, President Biden, you know, there's been a couple of proposals, the STEP Act, and then also President Biden's Green Book, which is kind of his revenue proposal, as we talked about before. And essentially, um, the appreciation inside trusts would be taxed you know step back was 21 years um and um president biden would be 90 years but 90 years kind of interesting 90 years started in january 1st 1940 so the first time it would be triggered would be in 2030. so you're talking about trust that have been going on very long periods of time as, as attorneys i'm sure we'll go back to uh law school and kind of the rule of perpetuities has kind of been eliminated by most states. So the rule that uh, trust had to end within a life and being plus 21 years has kind of been eliminated, allowing trust to kind of go on indefinitely. And this, uh, the president's uh, proposal is to kind of end that. And after 90 years, which could be 2000, December 31st, 2030, which is about uh, nine years away, uh, they would be taxed on the unrealized appreciation inside that trust. So they wouldn't have to sell it. They wouldn't have to sell the asset. It would be taxed automatically. And the value would be based on a kind of a state and gift tax re return. So there'd be a deemed sale uh, after 90 years, which is uh, nine years. So it's something one tenth of the time, but uh, you'd be looking at paying taxes on the unrealized appreciation. So if you put 
Target stock inside a trust. Uh, you're the founder of Target. You put the stock inside the trust for your family, and they just keep on collecting the dividends and never sell the stock. Uh, in 2030, um, you could be subject to tax on the value of the appreciation of stock, which could be very, very significant. And this is kind of a, a, where we kind of look at pretty much the same kind of idea, non-grantor trusts, where they're looking to tax um, distributions from the trust, transfers from the trust, on unrealized appreciation. This is the other idea, um, is the kind of tax when the donor would get his $1 million exemption from capital gains tax would also possibly apply to his gifting. So he's got a $1 million gifting exemption and a $1 million kind of capital gains um, exemption on transfers or on his estate tax. And once he goes over that, if he transfers funds to a uh, trust that are appreciated in value, that transfer would uh, be a taxable event. So the transfer of a million dollars of stock, $5 million of stock to the trust um, would be a taxable capital gains event. Now, how all these ideas work interchangeably, uh, work with, with each other is unclear at this point. Um, but these are the ideas where the rules are going. Uh, as we said, 50-50 in the Senate, six seat advantage in the House. Um, I think we're looking at some kind of revenue bill, but you know, what it's going to look like is unknown. Uh, and also one of the proposals, the same proposal was that distributions of, from the trust of appreciated property would be a taxable event. So transfers to the trust would be a taxable event and distributions from the trust would be a taxable event, unless it's going to the spouse or unless it's going to uh, the dean owner to discharge one of the debts or the dean owner himself. And, you know, many of our clients, you know, we have a lot of clients in Florida, uh, for and many clients here in New Jersey, New York area, who are using revocable trust. You know, real, a revocable trust, um, you know, is treated as a grantor trust, generally the, uh, the grantor of the trust is the person who's getting all the income, um, pro principal distributions, and they can end it at any time. So it's a revocable trust. Now, they would not be subject to tax on the appreciation because they're the ones who would get the money back. But at the time the trust becomes uh, irrevocable or the time uh, the owner dies, that's when it would be subject to um, a capital gains income tax event. Proposed wealth tax. <clears throat> this got a lot of play. Um, where it's going, no one knows. It seems like, I would tend to think this would be a dead issue. This would be very difficult to uh, finance. So if you're Jeff, Jeff Bezos worth $100 billion, he has a potential tax on his assets every year of 3%. Um, you know, Jeff could probably sell some of his uh, Amazon stock to pay for that, but a lot of a lot of people who are, uh, say President Trump, you know, all of his assets are in real estate. If he is worth billions of dollars, he'd be subject to this tax. You know, how, the question is how you value. Someone who owns Amazon stock is very easy to value. Uh, someone who owns real estate is going to be very difficult to value. Whether they're going to value that every year, or is there going to be some kind of proposed formula? Um, same thing with partnerships, uh, S corporations, gold deal corporations. You know, it's going to be very difficult to value and, you know, to pay the tax. If you have a gold deal corporation, are you going to have to, you know, um, how are you going to pay that tax if you don't have the liquid funds to pay tax on uh, a billion dollars? So it seems like this one kind of got a lot of play, but it's kind of dying out. I think the estate tax proposals are probably um, more in the direction that we're kind of uh, be going forward with. Uh, Katie, why don't we lost, uh, launch another polling question before we kind of change gears? Okay. The New Jersey estate tax applies to non-residents. Yes, no, real and tangible property only. New Jersey has no estate tax. New Jersey estate tax applies to non-residents. Yes, no, uh, real and tangible property only. New Jersey has no estate tax. I'll give everybody a minute to answer.
New Jersey estate tax. That's the key words. Fifty-five percent said no New Jersey estate tax, and that is the correct answer. Kind of a, as we're talking the death of uh, the estate tax, New Jersey was on board with that, and uh, I think it was part of the deal to increase the sales tax rate. And as part of the deal, they eliminated the estate tax, and to, uh, which basically started in 2018. Uh, as we talked about before, New Jersey inherited the tax lived on. So. All right, we're kind of going to shift gears and just so everybody understands, we're going to the current rules now. So what we're talking about before were proposed rules, uh, where things are going, and kind of, I thought it was key to kind of go over that first because it, it's a little bit higher end. Um, you, it's a little more, um, you need some knowledge to kind of understand some of those concepts, but the uh, estate planning knowledge to understand the concepts, but even if you don't completely understand the concepts, I just wanted to make sure you understood that uh, by the end of 2021, things could be seriously changing, whether it's 2021, maybe 2000, end of 2022. Uh, seems to be things are trending towards creating an estate tax and trending towards uh, increased tax on wealth, especially wealth over a million dollars uh, transferring, especially wealth over three and a half million dollars or seven million dollars for a couple. So we're going to kind of move, we're moving to current law, we're moving to kind of a little more basic concepts, just so make sure, and this will, if you didn't under, completely understand the beginning part, you know, we're going to send out the PowerPoint and you can kind of kind of back over it uh, based on uh, what we're going to kind of talk about now, which is a little bit more on the basic side. As we kind of talked about this uh, uh, several times, the highest rate right now is $11.7 million. Uh, for 2021, it's indexed for inflation, so it keeps going up every year. As we, as I said, 2026, it could go back down because the Trump increase could disappear, and it would be probably in about the five, late, high five, six range, low six range, just kind of guesstimating. And as we talked about with portability, you know, each spouse has got their own 11.7 million dollar exemption, and uh, combined is 23.4 million dollars. And we'll talk about a little more about portability as we go on. Uh, where the, the one spouse's exemption kind of transfers over to the other spouse uh, upon their death. And kind of getting into the real basics here, the federal estate tax return uh, is due nine months after date of death, and uh, federal gift tax return is due April 15th every year. So, and this year, I don't know if you practice in this area at all, um, you know, they extended the due date of 1040s to May 15th or May 17th, I think it actually was, but they didn't extend gift tax returns. So the IRS had some crazy rule where um, if you extended your 1040 before April 15th, your gift tax return was extended. The general rule if is if you extend your uh, 1040, your gift tax return is automatically extended. Uh, the rule this year was if you extended your 1040 before April 15th, your gift tax return was automatically extended. If you didn't extend your 1040 before April 15th, um, you had to file a separate gift tax return extension, which uh, you know happens a lot because everybody everything was kind of running behind this year. So you know usually if you file an extension for the 1040, you didn't have to worry about the gift tax return extension. This year you did. Uh, how the IRS is going to track that, I do not know. So and one thing to keep in mind that 11.7 million dollar exemption is uh, an estate gift tax exemption. So. One of the things we kind of talk about, I, I've kind of experienced uh, several times when clients kind of um, have a decedent has passed away, the children are the beneficiaries of the estate, and you know they think the parent never made any taxable gifts. And I've actually uh, had the pleasure of experiencing um, kind of the uh, IRS surprisingly sometimes being able to find a gift tax return filed in 1998 or 1999. Uh, but the children, obviously, you know, it puts the, the, the children, the beneficiaries, the executor or the administrator in a very uh, uh, difficult position because they're trying to, tr they don't always know what their parent uh, 
or uh, the decedent uh, made a taxable gift 20, 30 years ago. And it's uh, not always easy to uh, know. And sometimes you get a, a little notice from the IRS that they figured out that a gift tax return was filed years ago. And I, I actually, as it doesn't come up often, uh, but every once in a while, surprisingly, because gift tax returns are paper files. So they're you know, scanned in somewhere, uh, assuming in the United States, and I guess they have access to it. As we kind of talked about before with this $11.7 million exemption, you know, there's very few federal state tax returns filed. Uh, most are probably filed for portability, and then the few are paying uh, a state tax. So the federal state tax has really kind of played less and less in the planning as years have gone by. As we talked about, it's probably going to play more in the planning in the future. And as we kind of talked about a few minutes ago, the New Jersey state tax has gone out the window too. So the value, you know, the state tax is based on the value of your assets. That has basically, up to 2021, has been largely eliminated for a lot of clients, unless they have, you know, very significant wealth. So it's clients are more easily able to make gifts to whoever they want, more easily able to transfer assets to whatever they, whoever they want. But New Jersey inheritance tax is the one tax that kind of has lingered on. The New Jersey inheritance tax is based on who receives the assets. So it's not based on the value of the assets, it's based on who receives the assets. And anyone who practices in this area, it's kind of not like, it's not like filing a 1040. When you file a 1040, you probably have a very low risk of being audited, um, you know, unless you have significant uh, cash receipts, unless the IRS has an idea of something going on from something else. Um, you, your risk of being audited if you're a W-2 employee and um, you know, have uh, 1099 from uh, stocks and consolidated brokerage accounts, your risk of being audited is very little. The IRS is going to check um, against what's filed with them versus what you report. And, you know, if you might get a notice based on if you don't report some income by mistake. So unless you have a business, um, your risk of being audited is relatively remote. New Jersey inheritance tax returns, federal state tax returns, your risk of being audited goes up drastically. You know, for a New Jersey inheritance tax return, you know, I always tell clients there's a 20, 25% chance um, that the um, jersey is going to come back to me asking for proof of some expense, the value that we use on the return. So it's not, there's, you know, it's a paper filed returns and the IRS, New Jersey, there's a high chance that an individual is going to look at that return and possibly request additional information. Okay. Now, New Jersey inheritance tax is the one tax that's kind of been lingering on uh, here in uh, New Jersey is due eight months after date of death and applies to residents and non-residents. Now the New Jersey estate tax surprisingly only applied to residents. New Jersey estate tax, when it existed, no longer exists, did not apply to non-residents. So there was kind of a couple of little uh, uh, tricks in that, uh, that polling question. Now one of the things I always try to keep clients is you gotta make a payment within nine months uh, we can file for an extension, but we got to make sure we make that payment because the interest rate, uh, me and you in the bank, uh, we're probably getting about 0.1%. You know, if you have 10-year treasury bonds, uh, I think the yield is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.6%. Uh, the late payment interest on New Jersey inheritance tax is 10%. So that, that's a good chunk of change, and I've actually seen it, unfortunately, uh, on returns that people didn't file. Um, come back to haunt them at uh, very significant levels to the level where the, uh, the the interest is much greater than the tax. So if it goes on for years, which uh, we'll kind of talk about tax waivers a little bit later, you know, if you go to sell property years from now and the title's still in your mom, um, say in your uncle's name uh, and it never got changed over and you go to sell it, that's, you know, it's going to trigger inheritance tax because you're going to need tax waiver to transfer that. Now, what does New Jersey tax? If you're a resident, it taxes real and tangible property located in New Jersey. So um, your house, 
your vacation home down the shore at LBI, it's going to tax those type things for residents. And for residents, it's going to tax basically all your property. We're going to talk about some exemptions, but take taxing all your property, your stocks and bonds, your bank accounts, uh, your S corporation, your partnership interest, it's taxing all those, what they call intangible property. Now, non-residents, this is why it's important uh, distinction, uh, non-residents are only subject to tax on real intangible property located here in New Jersey. Now, um, there's no tax on intangible property. So this is kind of an issue. We have a lot of people in New Jersey who um, have moved to Florida, keep their home here in New Jersey. We also um, have a lot of people like me who don't have children. So I don't have class A beneficiaries necessarily to give my money to. So, um, you know, if you're living in Florida and you maintain that house here in New Jersey, um, that house in New Jersey could be subject to inheritance tax if it went to your niece and nephew. Um, so therefore, it's something to keep in mind. So even though you're living in Florida, uh, you're escaping estate tax on your uh, intangible property. If you keep that real property here in New Jersey, the house down the LBI that you come to during the summer, you could be subject to inheritance tax if it goes to certain people. Okay. And those certain people are. Now, class A, you know, and I think this is one of the reasons why inheritance tax, I kept, we talked about this years ago, I think one of the reasons why inheritance tax has kind of um, stayed around is because of the exempt class. The exempt class, class A beneficiaries, they don't, they're not subject to inheritance tax on the, uh, the property that goes to them. So it's not based on the value of your estate, it's based on who receives the property. So your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, they're not subject to uh, inheritance tax. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's stuck around because it doesn't seem at least at the time, it did not seem unfair um, because your, your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, they all receive the property um, tax rate. While Class C beneficiaries, they have a $25,000 exemption, your brother, your sister, your nieces and nephews, which are Class D, your friends, uh, they, I kind of think they were kind of viewed as receiving a windfall. And therefore, and it also applied to less people. So I think that's why inheritance taxes kind of remain was the brother, the sister, the niece, nephew, the friends who receive uh, inheritance uh, from a person to, um, who's not closely related to them is viewed as receiving a windfall. And uh, the, uh, the politicians didn't get as much pressure to kind of uh, eliminate that tax because it applies to few people. And they kind of won the lottery by getting uh, an inheritance. Also class E exempt uh, state federal government, New Jersey, religious organizations. One issue we always, I always try to kind of uh, deal with clients is they want to be uh, charitable. And I always try to push them towards specific bequests to avoid having to do a final accounting to uh, New Jersey Attorney General's Law. So if they receive 10% of the residue, you know, New Jersey uh, wants to make sure they got 10% of the right amount of money. If they just get $100,000, $100,000 to $100,000. So, you know, you write the check for $100,000, and New Jersey knows that they got the right amount of money. Uh, when it's a percentage of the residue, then it gets a little more tricky to make sure that they're getting the proper percentage. So key takeaway, if you're not familiar with New Jersey inheritance tax, class A beneficiaries, not subject to inheritance tax, uh, spouse, children, the grandchildren, uh, charities, not subject to inheritance tax, uh, Jersey charities, not subject to inheritance tax, but the brother, the sister, the niece, nephew, and friend, they're subject to inheritance tax. This is, I, I think, the top area that is confusing to clients, um, to non estate tax planning professionals, and uh, to accountants, to most people. You know, the idea for most people is you write your will, and that's going to say where my assets go. And that's a pretty easy concept to understand. I'm writing my will, I'm saying my assets are going to uh, XYZ person, and that's where I want them to go. Um, but that's not necessarily, uh, your will's not necessarily controlling those assets. So the key concept to remember, and it's very difficult to uh, explain this to clients because they've heard about wills for years and years and they've been told that's where it's gonna control uh, where my assets are going, 
uh, and you have to kind of uh, teach the client to understand that's not necessarily true. So a probate, your probate property, that's what's being controlled by your will, and those are assets that are titled in the name of the decedent. So you, it's titled in uh, John Smith's name. John Smith's uh, uh, the house is titled only in John Smith's name, and John Smith's will can control where that property goes. Also, John Smith uh, doesn't name beneficiary of his IRA. Uh, his will is going to control it in most cases. Uh, Non-probate property. This is the area that gets confusing for clients. Is it's included in your state? It's included in your state for estate tax purposes. Uh, it's included in your state for inheritance tax purposes, but it's not controlled by your will. It's controlled by the contract. So an IRA, you name a beneficiary of the account. That's where it's going. You can name uh, James Smith as the beneficiary of your will. But if uh, Thomas Smith is named the beneficiary of your 401k, IRA, uh, life insurance, it's going to uh, Thomas Smith. And that's a difficult uh, concept to kind of understand for a lot of clients. If you have a bank account and you have a joint bank account with a writer of survivorship uh, in the name of someone uh, other than the person you named you will, that's where the money's going. Pay on death, same thing. Real property held by tenants entirety. I think in most cases, most spouse wants the property to transfer the other one, so it's less of an issue. But if you held real property with right or survivorship uh, with someone other than your spouse, uh, say you know you own a house uh, and for some reason got titled real property uh, right or survivorship with your brother, it's going to your brother. It's not going to uh, your spouse. So it, you know that is something you. The first question. I always say for uh, attorneys when you're doing your state planning is A, uh, is your, are you a citizen? Is your spouse a U.S. citizen? The second question is you want to make sure you kind of get a idea of their property, the value of their property, and the titling, and if there's any named beneficiary in the account. So uh, irrevocable trust, that's non-probate property. A lot of times irrevocable trust is not going to be included in their estate, but as we kind of talked about, the revocable trust is. And um, it's non-probate property, but it's included in their uh, taxable state in most cases. And same thing with a life estate. So the person keeps a life estate. A lot of times it's being done for Medicaid planning is that they put a life estate in their house. Uh, they maintain it. It's going to be included in your estate for state tax purposes. Um, most times inheritance tax purposes. And, but it is not going to... Uh, it's non-probate property in most cases because it's going transferring automatically. Now, life estate is interesting because if the life estate is created by someone else and you just held that life estate that extinguished upon your death, then uh, it's uh, probably not going to be subject to estate tax because it wasn't your asset. Uh, New Jersey inherited tax exemption. The one that always is a little tricky and uh, many, many years ago came back to haunt me is uh, payments from New Jersey Public Employees Retirement System, New Jersey Teachers Pension Funds, and New Jersey Police and Firemen's Retirement System. So those payments are not subject to inheritance tax. And uh, that, you know, we have a lot of, uh, you know, teachers have a lot of the uh, firemen, police officers. So that one comes up a lot. So you always want to keep that in mind is those payments from those eight, those, uh, uh, entities are not subject to inheritance tax. Katie, why don't we lost, uh, launch another polling question? New Jersey inheritance tax class C beneficiaries includes uh, mother and father, brother and sister, niece and nephew, and, or uh, charities. So who is the class C beneficiaries? Mother and father, brother and sister, niece and nephew, charities. Does everybody have a minute to answer? Unfortunately, most people, the majority got it wrong, unfortunately. Um, 
You can blame me. Uh, brothers and sisters are your Class C beneficiaries. They have a $25,000 exemption. These nephews are Class D. Charities are Class E. Mother and father are Class A. Okay. One of the key differences between um, federal state tax and New Jersey inheritance tax is that the main beneficiary um, and the state if the decedent passes away owning the policy or the proceeds are payable to the estate, it's included in their estate for uh, estate tax purposes. It's based on uh, ownership, based on value. Inheritance tax uh, is only included in the estate if it's the estate is the beneficiary of the policy. So that it's, it seems very strange that it's done that way because you could have a class C, class D, you have your niece and nephew <coughs> be the beneficiary of the policy, but it's not subject to inheritance tax. So that's a key differential. In the state, the decedent owns the policy, and um, he names his niece and nephew as the beneficiaries of the policy. It's included in his estate, his gross estate, for state tax purposes. Inheritance tax, if he names his niece and nephew as the named beneficiary, it's not included for inheritance tax, even though nieces and nephews are generally subject to inheritance tax. And as we kind of talked about life insurance trust, you know, this is one of the key areas that they're attacking, uh, looking to kind of uh, their proposals kind of be going after is life insurance trust is, you know, when you transfer uh, existing policy into a life insurance trust to move it out of your taxable estate, there's a three year look back or the, or the trust buys the policy, there's no look back period. So you transfer, you trust buys a policy worth $5 million. Uh, that's not included in your state for federal state tax purposes. And that's one of the areas, you know, generally most life insurance trusts are grantor trust. And, you know, under the proposals, the grantor trust would be included in the state. But under current rules, a life insurance trust is not included uh, in federal state tax uh, gross estate. So as long as you're beyond the, the three year look back period for transferring the policy, it avoids the state taxes. And you know, if their proposal goes through, that would be a key change because a lot of life insurance trusts have been created, and the key will be whether what type of look back there is. Now, this is one area that kind of always creates a lot of confusion: uh, is you have a partnership, and the partnership interest uh, partnership owns real property, or the corporation owns real property in New Jersey, and whether. Um, so you own a house rental property here in New Jersey and it's whole, owned by the partnership or it's owned by a corporation. And what New Jersey treats that as is intangible property, which as a non-resident, you're not subject to tax on your intangible property. And there, therefore that real property is not subject to New Jersey inheritance tax. And that's a key factor. And it can be used to uh, kind of manipulate the system um, to avoid inheritance tax. Now, there's supposed to be a bona fide reason for the partnership. Now, if you know uh, income taxes a little bit, you know you generally don't want to transfer property into the real property into a corporation because it's easy to get into a corporation, hard to get out. Uh, C corporations not doesn't have uh, capital gains rates. Um, a partnership kind of a little bit easier. You can do 99% with yourself, 1% with a family member. Um, you know. The technical rule, it has to be a bona fide partnership. So if it's a bona fide partnership, uh, New Jersey treats it as intangible property and it's not subject to New Jersey inheritance tax uh, for non-residents. So real property by a non-resident generally subject to inheritance tax is held inside a entity, uh, partnership or corporation, uh, it escapes the inheritance tax. And this is a, this is a key factor uh, kind of kind of just quickly go through some of the differences between federal state tax and New Jersey inheritance tax is that inheritance tax has a three year look back. So that your transfer to your um, get smart, New Jersey doesn't have a gift tax. So New Jersey doesn't have a gift tax. There's no reporting for New Jersey of gifts. So you have a house, you know you get advised that your um, if you leave that house to your niece and nephew, that million dollar house is going to be subject to inheritance tax at say 15, 16 percent. 
So you're looking to avoid $150,000, $160,000 in New Jersey inheritance tax. Well, New Jersey doesn't have gift tax. So therefore, you give it to your niece and nephew, and New Jersey has a three-year look back on that gift for inheritance tax purposes. Gifts in contemplation of death. So New Jersey would pull that back into your, most likely pull that back into your taxable um, inheritance tax um, estate and subject to tax if you passed away within that three-year period. So the state tax, federal state tax, really only has a look back period primarily for life insurance. Um, tenants by the entirety, tenants by the entirety, you know, your whole property with your spouse, that's what tenants entirety, you your property with your spouse, with your survivorship, it's uh, generally not reported on the inheritance tax return. Those are a couple of key differences. Along with what we talked about before, inheritance tax, based on the beneficiary, your niece, your nephew, your brother, your sister, goes to your spouse, your mother, your father, your children, not subject to tax, niece, nephew, brother, sister, subject to tax, estate tax, and based on the value. You know, this was very, as a title, was very important before portability. You know, before portability, you wanted to make sure your spouse had enough assets to use uh, their estate tax exemption. It seems like portability is going to survive, um, and we'll talk about portability in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Hopefully we'll get to it. Um, the state of port portability kind of limited the need to start transferring assets between spouses to make sure one spouse had $11.7 million, even though uh, the one other spouse was really the person who created the wealth, so they had $23.4 million, but they wanted to make sure this other spouse could use their exemption, $11.7 million exemption, so you start transferring assets to the other spouse to make sure they had assets to use their exemption on. Um, with portability, it's kind of eliminated a lot of that. It's eliminated a lot of the need to transfer assets to the other spouse, because even if the other spouse doesn't have any assets, you file the estate tax return, um, the portability of their estate tax exemption, $11.7 million, comes over to the uh, other spouse. So um, the other spouse doesn't lose the opportunity, the surviving spouse wouldn't lose the opportunity to use the uh, estate and gift tax exemption of the decedent spouse, the spouse with no assets, uh, because you didn't transfer uh, title. So they kind of eliminate the semantics of having to do that with portability. I, I think it's always good to remember uh, for those who don't really practice this area, joint tenants with right of survivorship with your spouse, 50% of the value is included in your state. Um, Non-spouse, it's based on the consideration of the joint owner. So if, uh, if you have your account with your brother and your sister and you put 100% of the funds into that account, it's 100% uh, included in your state for federal state tax purposes and uh, inheritance tax purposes. Uh, tenants in common. Tenants in common is where you own part of the account and uh, your joint owner owns the other part of the account. So you don't own it with right of survivorship. You each own a piece of the account. So if I create an account with uh, an account with $1 million and I transfer, kind of become joint owner with someone else, I'm making a gift at the time of that transfer. So, um, in the donee's ownership, you've already reported that as a gift at the time of the transfer. So, therefore, the uh, donee's ownership interest is not included in the estate. So, tenants in common, each person would own their own little piece of it individually. There's no right of survivorship, and it's a gift at the time of the creation of the account or the transfer. We talked kind of about life estate. Life estate, if you're the one creating the life estate, uh, it's going to be included in your estate. If you don't create the life estate and you just held it, uh, you received it from somebody else, it's probably not going to be included in your estate. Um, gift tax, there's a little bit of rules on that with Q-tips uh, or marital deduction. Gift tax, this is always a little bit of an interesting thing. Uh, most clients don't realize this. And uh, after this, uh, Katie, we're going to ask another polling question or two. Um, gift tax, when you transfer property, um, you maintain a life estate or a term of years and your children become the remainder beneficiaries of that house, you have to do it 
as a trust, a Cupert or uh, principal resident trust. Otherwise, your retained interest has zero value. It's deemed to have zero value, making a gift of the whole amount. So, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind that if you want to transfer, you're worried about having a taxable state, uh, and you want to maintain, uh, make sure the remainder interest has a value so it limits your gift. Um, you want to make sure that um, you set it up as a Cooper quasi personal residence trust um, to make sure that that remains your interest that you give to your children has a, that, um, has a value. Otherwise, it's valued to nothing. A life estate, if you maintain a life estate, you die passing with a life estate, it's going to be included in your taxable federal estate. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Or if you have a term of years and you die during a period of term of years, so you maintain the interest for 10 years, uh, doing a Cooper, if you die during that term of years, it's going to be included in your uh, estate, the whole value. So, um, Katie, why don't we launch, launch two polling questions so we kind of catch up here. An account in the name of a revocable trust requires a New Jersey tax waiver to transfer. All right, so this is, we're kind of uh, pushing ahead a little bit here. Um, an account in the name of a revocable trust requires a New Jersey tax waiver to transfer. You think it does or you think it doesn't? Yes or no? A revocable trust is, as we kind of talked about, is a non-probate asset and it goes automatically to the beneficiary's name and the revocable trust. So does that require a tax waiver or not? We'll give everybody another second. Thirty-five percent yes, sixty-five percent no. So no is the correct answer. It does not require a tax waiver. All right, Katie wants a second question, please. Life insurance proceeds uh, payable to a named beneficiary is subject to federal state tax, New Jersey inheritance tax, federal state tax, and New Jersey inheritance tax and federal state tax and New Jersey estate tax. As we kind of talk about, I'll give you a little hint, uh, we said New Jersey doesn't have an estate tax. So the fourth one is not right. It's a subject of federal state tax, New Jersey inheritance tax, or federal state tax and New Jersey inheritance tax. Give everybody a second to answer. And the correct answer is life insurance proceeds payable to a named beneficiary subject to federal estate tax. By named beneficiary, I said an individual, I should probably be a little bit more clear on that. Um, if it's payable to New Jersey, uh, if your uh, niece and nephew is not subject to inheritance tax. So even though your niece and nephew would be subject to inheritance tax, if it's paid to a named beneficiary, there's no inheritance tax. So it's only subject to estate tax. Okay. Tax waivers. I think this is, you know, for years and years, this is probably the most common question uh, I've received is tax waivers. Um, New Jersey has a system where um, before certain accounts, before certain property can be transferred, they require a tax waiver to make sure uh, the inheritance tax is paid. It's, it kind of stems from the state tax. As we talked about, New Jersey has had a state tax. It was 675 for years, which was a very low threshold. Then it went to a million, 1.5 million, then it went to 2 million, and then eliminated. Um, so this is now we're kind of in a situation where most properties passing to uh, children, spouse, uh, mother and father. Um, so most cases, there's no inheritance tax. So waivers become a key player in trying to get access to the assets. So the decedent passed away. Uh, New Jersey requires uh, filing of a tax waiver in order to transfer the property. Now, there's also uh, New Jersey, after you file your inheritance tax return, uh, you get waivers. 
uh, based on if you didn't qualify for an L8, as we're going to talk about, or L9, you have to file the estate tax return, and then you get the tax waivers for your accounts. Now, unfortunately, as most of, if anybody practices here, uh, New Jersey can take six months, nine months, sometimes it's their quick three months, but it takes a long period to get access to uh, all the funds uh, by filing an inheritance tax return. Uh, tax, while an L8, as we'll kind of talk about here in a second, um, gives you access to those funds right away. Now, New Jersey, um, I assume they realize that you never know what New Jersey's thinking, as most of us kind of who live here know. Um, but you've always been allowed to do a blanket waiver where you get 50% access to 50% of the funds in the account. So 50% of the funds can be transferred and used. And this is, you know, for some banks, it, it is a spotty, spotty thing. Uh, 50%, you know, some banks will let you transfer a whole amount. Uh, some banks like Bank of America will give you problems transferring one dime. So, but technically the answer is, uh, no matter what the bank tells you, they get to sometimes kick it up the corporate ladder. You do get access to 50% of the, the account uh, as kind of a blanket waiver. And you know you need uh, tax waivers, as we kind of talk, uh, are going to talk about for bank accounts, for brokerage accounts, uh, doing business in New Jersey, which you know Fidelity, pretty much every uh, company is Vanguard, uh, New Jersey corporations, New Jersey bonds, uh, New Jersey uh, real property. Um, as we kind of talked about before, assets owned by the trust uh, are not do not require a waiver. Um, okay, just because we're running short on time, why don't you launch another polling question, please, before we get to LAs? Okay, affordability doesn't apply to which tax? So we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit here. Affordability doesn't apply to federal uh, estate tax. So. Uh, federal gift tax, federal generous, generation skipping tax. So portability, your port of, your your exemption uh, from the deceased spouse that you receive as part of portability, um, which tax is not covered by portability of that, that your deceased spouse exemption? Give everybody a minute to answer. This is a little bit a little bit tricky one because we haven't gotten to it yet. everybody just look because we're running short of time we're going to kind of cut it down a little bit so if everybody could answer right now would be great generation skipping tax and we'll talk we'll talk about that in a second is the correct answer and half of you uh, probably are pretty experienced practitioners that use that or very lucky guessers so just a real quick I, I want to get to portability um, self-executing waivers basically l8 all the beneficiaries are Class A. Uh, there are no trust or disclaimers filed. You give the bank the L8, and they're supposed to give you access to the account. Now, the bank might, you know, most banks, I think, know this, and they probably receive many, but it's, sometimes it seems like some banks have never uh, received an L8, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, but it's a self-executed waiver. You prepare it, you give it to the bank, and you're done. If you're, everybody's Class A beneficiaries. New Jersey doesn't have an estate tax, so it's just a matter of being uh, not subject to inheritance tax. Now, if there's trust or disclaimers, the uh, basically the person disclaims their interest in the estate, then they don't want you using a um, LA. You're not eligible to use an LA. No sisters, brothers, sons-in-laws, nieces, nephews uh, are not eligible to use an LA because they are subject to uh, inheritance tax. L9. You don't see this used as much anymore for uh, transferring real property. Um, in most cases, the title insurance company is going to hold back the funds on the the sale. So it seems like people are using it less these days, and it's more just the title insurance company holding back funds uh, for inheritance tax purposes. Okay, so I'm going to move real quick. Portability. You know, Kate, why don't we, since we're running short on time, why don't you launch the last poll in question? Okay, Form 8978. Form 8978. If you uh, 
applies to cash distributions to beneficiaries, assets sold during the estate administration, estates filing only for portability, uh, estates with a federal form 706 on assignment. So for me, as we kind of, uh, as you guys give your answer, or kind of talk about form 8978 real quick. Uh, form 8978 kind of created a few years ago. Uh, so base, the IRS wants to make sure that the estate and the beneficiary report the same tax basis. And um, it really only applies to estates with a 706 filing requirement. Cash, cash is cash. So you're seeing cash, your tax basis and cash is cash. If the asset was sold during the administration of the state, um, the beneficiary is probably receiving cash and you know, there's no 8978 requirement to report that asset. Um, if you're filing only for portability, you don't have a filing requirement, you're below the $11.7 million, you don't have to do the 8978. And if you do, if you have to file the 706, uh, that's where you have the portability requirement. So, Okay, you want me to close the voting in a second? Real quick now as we're closing out, portability, the key thing I want you to remember is the exemption could be going down to $3.5 million. Portability, as we talked about, see the spouse passes away, they didn't use all their federal state tax exemption, and it goes over to the, uh, the surviving spouse uh, only if you file a tax return and make the election on a form seven, uh, federal form 706. The state tax exemption is going down. It seems like portability is going to survive. Uh, so it's very important. The exemption could not go down to $3.5 million. And you know, uh, a lot of people we're thinking right now might not have a taxable state $11.7 million. Um, 23.4 million between the two, and that might only become seven months. You want to keep an eye on this. And the other thing to keep in mind is it doesn't apply to generation skipping tax, uh, non citizen, non resident aliens, and the suit is not placed in justice. But most importantly, if you it used to be you had to file this within nine months, plus the extension six uh, months. So if you didn't file an extension, you really only had nine months. Now, under this Rev Prop 2017 30, uh, 34, it's been in effect for a while, but make sure everybody knows about this is that you have two years to file for portability. So, if you missed, the, you didn't file a state tax return, um, you have two years to file for portability from the date of death, as long as the decedent didn't have a filing requirement under U.S. citizen. And then you put this information right here, filed pursuant to revenue procedure. Um, so, that's the key thing to keep in mind. That if you have people, if the state tax exemption goes down, or it looks like it's going to go down, you might want to make sure that uh, if you had someone, um, even if you're a year and a half ago, you file for portability now at 706. So I think that pretty much closes us out. Um, I think we did all the polling questions. So, um, you know, if people put questions or want to send me questions, I'm happy to answer them. And, you know, we'll kind of, since we ran short of time, I really didn't get a chance to ask any uh, take questions from everybody. But if you want to email uh, Katie or marketing or me directly, um, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you have. Uh, thank you for attending today. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, everybody got at least one thing out of the class um, to, um, you know, one time item that they kind of learned that they didn't learn before. And I know Katie, Katie wanted to say something about the um, uh, certificates and um, the evaluation form. Yeah, so thank you everybody who was on with us this morning. Um, you will all be receiving a copy of the presentation. We'll follow up with you after today and that way you have our contact information if you want to reach out to Glenn, like you said, with any of your questions. So we'll get you the slide deck and um, we'll also get you a survey, which should also pop up in your browser when you exit this webinar and that you will need to fill out for your credits. And um, shortly we'll send you your certificates. So thank you everyone for joining. Like Glenn said, I hope you found it informative and we will be in touch with you all after this. Thanks again. Thank you everybody.